Hey there, hi there, ho there. Welcome to a Thursday Collection Connection, where we're playing that game. It's just an excuse to talk about records. I play the game with my brother, Plastic Eric, over on the Plastic Soundway Cult channel. Every Monday, he talks about an album. Every Thursday, I talk about an album. And the connective tissue is that each album has to, in some way, relate to the album shown in the previous video. So now that we've covered the ground rules, let's move ahead. In Eric's last video, he talked about Tool's Fear Inoculum album. I don't know if it's more engineered for close listening instead of passive listening. Uh, he was right in that the sort of the length of the songs, I think I was more actively listening at the very beginning in the first song, the kind of the, the loop, the groove of the first song, uh, I thought wasn't bad. But as I got otherwise preoccupied and just sort of had it playing in the background, uh, it did start to feel like that uh, sort of heavy prog sound that just kind of kept going and going and going. Even though I don't strictly have a problem with long songs, uh, long songs that feel like they overstay their welcome <laughs> to me. Uh, so it doesn't make it a bad album by any stretch of the imagination. And the musicianship is, is clear and is there. And his uh, singing voice, uh, Maynard James Keenan, is that, what, is that his name? Is more palatable to me when he's kind of in a lower low register uh, than uh, some of the metal tinged lyrics or lyricists that uh, their singing voice really kind of turns me off uh, preemptively, regardless of the music. Anyway, I looked and to my knowledge, uh, looking it up, Fear Inoculum is the only album ever recorded that uses the word inoculum, which is a, a real word. It is the substance used in inoculations. So it's not made up. My first thought was to connect it to another album that used uh, an actual word, a not made up word that is the only occurrence in, in history of that word in an album title. But I quickly gave up on that. Instead, kind of went for the, for the easy pickings of the fact that Fear Inoculum opens up with its title track. Uh, title tracks themselves are not necessarily all that uncommon. Uh, some acts are more prone to it than others. But opening with the title track uh, is somewhat less common. There are some very famous examples of it. The, the Beatles uh, did it with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and it kind of counts, but all three of their uh, film soundtracks help, and Hard Day's Night and Yellow Submarine open with their respective title tracks. But beyond that, uh, the only other time that they had a title track was Let It Be, which did not open that album. Uh, but other examples are like Highway to Hell, opens with Highway to Hell, and uh, Arcade Fire, I know did it a couple times with uh, The Suburbs and Reflector. And so it's not super rare, but I think more often than not, uh, it just falls in the track listing somewhere, or maybe is even the closer of the album if they chose to go with a title track. And so the album whose title track is also its opening track, that I went with for the connection was the 2017 Beck album, Colors. Talked about Beck once before, uh, about a year ago, we did Odelay. And these two, even though uh, I have a handful of Beck albums, I don't have his full discography by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Odelay and Colors are my favorites. I don't feel like Colors really pushes boundaries necessarily. But uh, it's just sort of infectious movie butt pop music. Uh, I think it's really good. I really like uh, the singles, Dreams, Colors. Um, Colors being one of the few recent, uh, more modern music videos that I've actually ever seen that had uh, Alison Brie in it. And uh, it's kind of a cool video, cool artsy video. But I don't necessarily have a ton to say about 
the album other than the fact that I enjoy it. No distractions. I could name check some tracks that I really like. No distractions is a banger. Dreams, um, Seventh Heaven, uh, the second track is a good one. Uh, and so what I'm going to ruminate on instead is the fact that this was kind of a two-man project for the most part with Beck and Greg Kirsten, who I am familiar with from the band The Bird and the Bee, his direct work, but I just found out in the in doing the research for this, that he was also in the band Geggy Ta, which surprised me. And you may remember their hit from 1996, uh, Whoever You Are. Uh, and it went like, uh, all I want to do is to thank you, uh, even though I don't know who you are. That one, <laughs> you let me change lanes when I was driving in my car. That's all. kind of in that ska vein. Uh, so I'm thinking that maybe Eric would know the song. Wouldn't even floor me if he had uh, the CD because it's kind of in that uh, sublime uh, periphery that uh, he's very into. But yeah, Geggy Ta uh, was <laughs> Craig Kirsten and uh, another collaborator. And The Bird and the Bee, similarly, a duo with a collaborator. But he has not necessarily made his name, it's not a household name, but his greatest success hasn't been so much in the music that he has made uh, as the music that he's produced. So in a situation like this, even though there, there's some backing vocals from uh, Feist and Roger Manning Jr. of Jellyfish, and then strings were brought in who are, that are played by professional string players, most of the rest of the album was just played by these two guys. And uh, Greg Kirsten then won a Grammy uh, for this for uh, Best Engineered Album and Producer of the Year, I believe. And that was his second Producer of the Year Grammy. He won, I believe, for Adele's uh, 25. But he has produced uh, some crazy big hits from Sia and Adele, I believe Katy Perry, Lana Del Rey. Uh, a lot of female acts apparently, but also acts like The Shins and Foster the People. So he has been in the uh, producer's booth for a whole slew of acts and has been nominated a bunch of times, won a couple of Grammys himself. So I just found that that was the rabbit hole of uh, research that I ended up going down, was finding out more about Greg Kirsten because I didn't want to find out more about Beck necessarily. I haven't researched him before, but yeah, I don't know how people feel in general about colors. I like it. Uh, not every album has to be challenging or groundbreaking. It's uh, just some kind of ace pop. Um, I enjoy it quite a bit. I think it's fun to just put on and listen to. And so, yeah, I think even Eric has a copy of Colors himself on vinyl, perhaps. Oh, I will note, it would have been a good, uh, if you look at the cover there, would have been a good connection to uh, Talking Heads Remaining Light, which I did recently, uh, because their face Faces are mostly covered by splotches of color. I just thought that while I was looking at it, but uh, try and keep it relatively brief here. And I will throw Beck's colors over to Eric to make a connection. And you can look for that on the Plastic Soundwave Cult on Monday. So with that, I've said my piece. I thank you for watching. Bye-bye.